No. Hello, is that Patty? Oh, yes, it is. Hello, Patty. This is Ian Lee from Talk Radio. I, I, I believe we're booked to talk now. Are you free? Yes, I am, Ian. I just got a weird phone call. You know, one of those ones, you know, blah, 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 about absolute rubbish. <laughs> I thought... So I thought this was them phoning back again. Oh, it's normally about have you had an accident? You know, well, one of those. Have, I, I, I don't know. I hope, then, I hope they're not predicting. I, I, I don't know if you have checked if you have PPI, Patty, but I can look into that for you. <laughs> uh, listen, it's great. Well, crack on. It's, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, the, 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 this exhibition that's um, going to be launched, George, Eric, and me. Uh, tell me about it. What, what is it? Um, well, basically, there, there's a museum in Norway that wanted to show my photographs and memorabilia and all sorts of things that I could offer them. And they had this exhibition running for about three months a couple of summers ago, and it was very successful. And the Beatles Museum people heard about it and wanted the same thing, almost the same uh, uh, exhibition. So I've moved it from Norway to Liverpool, and there are photographs... You know, fun photographs of mainly fun ones of George. And I have the Beatles, maybe all of them, yes, all of them, yeah. that I took when we were in Rishikesh in India. We went there to meditate in 68. Now, this is, uh, listen, I, I'm i a huge Beatles fan, so I, I, if I geek if I geek off too much, Patty, you can, you can you know, tell me to back away a little bit. But all right. you, you, um, you introduced the Beatles to the Maharishi, didn't you? Well, I didn't completely. What happened was that while they were on tour in Australia, I believe, I thought I wanted to do something else with my life. And then I saw a little advertisement for to learn how to meditate. And I thought, oh, that's for me. And so I followed it up. And in fact, it was transcendental meditation. And I enrolled and learned how to meditate. So when the Beatles came back from Australia, I told George all about it. And he was very interested. And as luck would have it, I don't know, maybe a week or so went by. And then Paul phoned us to say there's someone called Maya Rishi who's come to London and he's going to talk about meditation at the Hilton, I think, in London. So, of course, if one Beatle does something, we all have to do it. <laughs> of course. You know, because we are one family, you know. Yeah. It's just very um, cosy and comforting and all those wonderful words. And uh, so we all went and they really wanted to learn more about meditation. So we went up to Wales and uh, and then while we were there, I think Maharishi, because their manager, Brian Epstein, died while we were in Wales. Yeah. And Maharishi could see how deeply upset everybody was. And this is why he suggested that perhaps we should go to India for about two months for more intensive uh, courses on meditation. What was India like? Because the stories I've read mm -hmm. paint it as being pretty basic. Well, yes, I mean, it's it's a third world country for a start. You know, we're cosily living in a first world country yeah. here in England. Um, but because it's a third world country, it doesn't mean that it's lacking in culture, love, religion and honesty and all these great old-fashioned values. It's a most beautiful country with an awful lot to offer. I'm absolutely mad about India. I love the food and the yeah. people are charming and gentle and sweet. Um, but it's, you know, I mean, it's, I can't criticise it, but, you know, if you're really used to living a very sort of civilised life in the West, perhaps India's not really for you because you've seen an awful lot of poverty. Yeah. And, um, I mean, but you have to get used to that. It's been like that for thousands of years. And how did how did the, the, the Beatles, the four Beatles, find it? Because obviously they were, you know, living the life of luxury. Yes, but you know what? They were all young. We were all very young. We were like 22, 23. And hadn't really got into the concept of luxury. You know, they were living the life that they wanted to live. And it was all fun. And we'd go to nightclubs and do whatever we want, whenever we wanted, except if they were recording or on tour. Um, and I think they, nobody minded, nobody complained about living in a very sort of simple way. The, school, the beds were really like, as far as I remember from my school days, rather like school beds. You yeah. know, the mattress is not very thick. Yeah. And, 
nobody minded, you know. I think everybody realised we're going for, you know, we're going, we're, we're here to learn something. Do you, do you um, still meditate, Patty? Do you still do TM? Yes, I do. But mm. I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a lazy person, I have to admit. So I don't meaning that I don't do it every day. Yeah. Um, how did you, you, you kind of grew up all over the place, didn't you? You moved from place to place. How did you end up becoming a model in the swinging 60s? Uh, well, that, actually, that was more by luck than any kind of design. I was working for Elizabeth Arden and somebody came in and said to me, asked me if I'd ever thought about being a model. Well, I had to tell a little bit of a fib. I said, no, <laughs> even, <laughs> though I, even though I've been combing the pages of Vogue and all these glamorous magazines and Jean Shrimpton was the star. And I said, oh, my God, I'd love to be her, you know, as all young girls do. Yeah. And um, and this woman came in from one of the teen magazines and asked me if I'd like to be a model. And I said, yeah, of course, yes. So I went and uh, in, she interviewed me and um, she got someone to take photographs and then introduced me to my future agent who took, signed me on straight away. And how, how uh, what kind of stuff were you doing? Just, you know, fashion mags and adverts and things like that? Yes, I was. Fashion mags, um, um, catalog work, yeah, and um, advertising, and you know, it was just like it was quite good. Looking back at my old appointments books now, I can't believe how much I was working. Really, constantly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you got a part in a hard day's night. Yes. Now that this is so funny, you know, because uh, my agent would send me for different interviews continually, you know, because I'd be working and then they'd say, go f to this address, interview, interview, interview. So I went along and I went in for the interview and I recognised one of the guys because I'd done a TV commercial with him before yeah. and his name was Dick Lester, but it seemed a little more important this time. There were more people staring at my portfolio and then I went home that afternoon and my agent phoned me early evening to say, I got a part in the Beatles film. Fantastic. I said, how on earth did that happen? <laughs> and they said, well, you know the last interview you went for, that's what it was for. And I panicked. I said, look, I'm really, I've never wanted to be an actress. I'm far too shy. I can't handle this. And they said, don't worry. You just have to wear a school uniform and only say one word. And I thought, well, I'm sure I can do that. <laughs> Were you a Beatles fan? Well, I like their music, you know. I mean, I yeah, I like their music. But I wasn't a sort of raving fan. I didn't go and see them in concert, you know. But I, 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 like, I loved what they were doing. Mm. And so, you know, it was, uh, it was a very exciting time, thinking that I was going to... However, I must tell you, yeah. it was so embarrassing, I thought, to meet these people who are so, like, clearly famous and going to be more famous, and I have to wear a wretched school uniform. <laughs> and I was, oh, no, 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 it's so unattractive. And, but did, what was was the attraction between you and... And if I ask anything that's too impersonal, just tell me to shut up. What was the attraction between you and George Instant? Was there, was there a certain magic or, or, or did it take a, a bit of time? There was an instant magic. I mean, he was deliciously looking. Mm. He was so good looking. Had the most beautiful brown eyes. And both of us being rather shy, we were kind of attracted to each other. And we sat next to each other at lunch on the train while they were filming. And, um, you know, we were just sort of... I thought he was unbelievably funny and amusing because yeah. I'd never met anyone from Liverpool before. And, of course, the language in Liverpool is so different from the language that, we you know... You know, they have so many different sayings. And I just wasn't sure what was going on. It was all, it was all rather giddy-making, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and he was so adorable and sweet and funny. I mean, what a great combo. Yeah. Um, and, and then you, you became part of the, the whole Beatles machinery. That must have been an incredible experience to see, you know, a worldwide phenomenon. And obviously a lot of this is recorded in these photographs at the exhibition. But to be in the middle of a worldwide phenomenon as it, as it was happening... Yeah, but look, of course, you know, I didn't realise. I thought just people in England, you know, knew of them. Yeah. Obviously, people in America and wherever they toured. But I had no, and none of us, and they didn't either, have any concept of quite how enormous they were becoming and would become later on. And I think with time, they've become even more iconic. Yeah.
I'm looking at some of the photos now, and they really are, you know... Um, well they're, well, they're family photos, aren't they? They're snaps. There's, a, there's a, a great picture of George topless on a bed with a pair of sunglasses yeah. by him. These, I mean, these are these, these are very intimate, aren't they? Yeah, do you know what? When I Before I started showing my photographs, I was really slightly unsure about if I'm revealing too much, mm. if, you know, these are too personal. And, uh, and I showed them to a few friends, and they said, no, they're lovely, you must share them. And... and it's the only way I can see it. I can't now go back and say, oh, my God, they're too personal. Because, you know, I think that they're lovely. And I would never show a photograph of somebody who wasn't looking good or the lighting yeah. was horrible or they were in a hideous position. You know, I'd never do that. Oh, they're, they're absolutely beautiful. And it is, um, you know, the, the, the intimacy of a family snap, you know, not, not the posed photos. You have been at, at, at several kind of pivotal rock moments um you were at the famous all you need is love performance weren't you yes what the hell was that like was it as much fun as it looks it was huge fun yeah I bet. there was enormous electricity in the air you know it was just like so exciting and also we knew we were told that while it was being filmed it would it would be shown around the world yeah i mean to me that was mind-blowing it was, it know, was like the first big satellite link up around the world, wasn't it? It was. Absolutely it was. And so to be the first was, you know, even more exciting. And to think we would be there as well. It was fabulous. Absolutely exciting and wonderful. And also, have I got this right? You were, you, um, were, you were there the first time that George and John Lennon um, took LSD. Well, yes. And it wasn't a particularly... It, it was done... It was, wasn't it the dentist that kind of spiked you all or something? Well, yes. I mean, you know, we thought he was quite charming because he invited us for dinner. Yeah. And so John was with his first wife, Cynthia, and George and I. So we went along and we thought, well, might as well do that, have dinner with him, and then afterwards we'd go and see Klaus Warman playing in some club in Soho. Yeah. So our evening was planned. So we went along and, you know, had some drinks and dinner and wine and it was all rather nice. And then we said, well, we've got to go now. I'm so sorry, but we're going to see Klaus. And they said, but you haven't had your coffee. So, you know, we had to sit down again, drink our coffee. And then we got up and went into the sitting room and just chatting. And then John said, we've really got to go. We don't want to miss them. And the dentist said, you can't possibly leave yet. John said, why? And he said, because you've just had LSD. Uh -oh. John freaked out because he, had, he understood what it was. Yeah. George and I and Cynthia, no idea, never heard of it. Didn't know why John was getting so angry. And um, anyway, that was it. John said, right, we're definitely leaving. So we left and we got into our little mini. <laughs> and... I can't tell you what it's like. I don't know if you've ever taken a drug as strong as that, but you become so enormous in your mind. Yeah. And so four people kept growing and growing in this tiny little mini. It was, you know, it was surreal and it was, it was hallucinogenic. So it was very scary. Yeah. And in fact, incredibly irresponsible of the dentist. Oh, of course, yeah. To have given us this, and knowing George was driving too, mm. but no, it was it was the most horrific experience. <laughs> it, 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 it does sound horrific, and yes, you know, if, if you're you're having a trip and it's not you know a controlled situation, of course it can be it can be terrifying. But that evening did shape um, rock music for for years to come, didn't it? Are you aware? Are you aware because you were there and all these different experiences? Are you aware of just how important um, those experiences were? No. No, because, you know, because for us, it was just our life. This is yeah. what we were doing. We had very little idea that anybody else knew how our life was going. You know, we didn't, we thought this is, I mean, nobody knows about your life, really, no, do they? No. You. you see, so, I mean, imagine if you now find out everybody knows exactly what you were doing. You know, it's sort of, it's a bit, it's rather odd it, it it must be because and I, I i must i would imagine that you get you know a, a, a contact or accosted by fans all the time who know everything you were doing on, on january the 32nd uh, 31st of 1967 and you know that they on february the 6th 1973 they know exactly where you were yes i know it's very very 
very odd, very odd indeed. It blows me away, actually, and I, I kind of, I don't really like it. Yeah, but, I can the, the, but then when I, I speak to, I mean, I've been speaking to this amazing uh, forensic historian who's writing three of the most enormous volumes. Oh, this is, is this the... um, Mark Lewison? Yes. Yes, yes. To, to me, he is a forensic historian. Yeah. He, his detail is fascinating. And so listening to him tell me about my life <laughs> is actually fantastic. His first you know, book, if I got this right, was 900 pages and it only went up to 1963. <laughs> yeah. That's in depth. <laughs> Well, that's why I call him a forensic historian. You um, uh, recently did a show as well with um, with Henry Diltz, the famous rock photographer yes. who I've kind of had dealings with. And but boy, oh boy, isn't he an absolute gentleman? What, what was that like, working with him? Oh, he is the most adorable man yeah. ever. Absolutely adorable. Um, and he photographs everything and anything. You know, so we can be walking down the street, Henry and I, and, you know, where is where's Henry? Miles back, <laughs> you know, blocks back. He's found something, some little thing in a window or somewhere that he's photographing. Yeah. He is so much fun, so, so talented, and he's great, great fun to be with. And we did um, a lovely tour of five different states of America in March, towards the end of March. And we did 13 shows where Henry first and then me would stand up in front of an audience and our, have our, we'd have our photographs large on a big screen. Yeah. And, and we would discuss them and, you know, tell funny tales about what was happening at the time. It's really fun to do it with Henry. Um, I, I'm going to let you go in a second, Patty. Just one more thing. You, you are the, um, you, you were amused. You may still be amused, but you certainly were amused and inspired, you know, three of the greatest love songs, at least, of all time. Layla, Wonderful Tonight and Something. Do you, um, do you kind of show off about that? Do you feel a weight of responsibility around that? Or do you just think, you know, that some men that were in love with you wrote some really nice songs about you? Yes, I think the latter. Yeah. Because, you know, there's no point in me getting hung up about, you know, well, it's being amused. I mean, so who am I now? <laughs> you know, only amusing. But, um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, how lucky I am. How yeah. lucky I am that, you know, those guys wrote beautiful songs. Patty, listen, thank you so much for your time uh, and thank you for sharing these photos because as a, a, a Beatles fan and a fan of, you know, of rock music and, and, and Clapton, of course, um, it, it's really nice to see, uh, you know, this kind of personal side of them that quite often you don't get to see. So thank you for that. My pleasure. I hope that everybody else enjoys seeing the photographs as well. I'm sure they will. Patty, thank yeah. you so much for your time. It's been a real thrill to talk to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.